When we discuss the themes of persecution and toleration, juxtaposing the martyrdoms of Catholic priests in Buddhist Japan with Protestant ministers in Catholic England, we noted that the prevailing political theories of the day emphasized the dangers of religious toleration. Toleration implied weakness, an inability to coerce those in error into accepting the one true faith, whatever that might be. Better to have a single religion in each realm governed by a single monarch, one people, one faith, one law. But reality, of course, is never quite that simple. Every country had religious minorities, some more significant than others. The same era that demanded religious uniformity witnessed some of the most destructive religious wars ever waged. The largest, the so-called Thirty Years' War that ravaged Central Europe, killed roughly a third of the German population, a proportion not matched until the Second World War. Persecuting religious minorities fostered constant instability, especially when those minorities could call on powerful external protectors. Eventually, Europe's exhausted rulers accepted a general peace, agreeing not to interfere in the affairs of one another. Some rulers, most notably Louis XIV in France, still pursued uniformity in their own realms, but they would no longer wage any further religious wars. But the live and let live attitude on the international level soon trickled down to the individual one. Advocates of toleration argued that the pursuit of uniformity had failed and that it was impossible to force someone to believe something against their will. Better to simply accept this reality rather than fight a losing battle against it. The Dutch had been among the first Europeans to agree with this perspective, approving a substantial level of religious freedom, though other powers were not far behind. The English Parliament passed the Toleration Act in 1689, granting a degree of freedom to Protestants who worshipped in churches outside the Church of England. And while most states granted toleration as a practical measure, some contemporaries began arguing for toleration as a good unto itself. They claimed that even to attempt to convert someone was immoral, since no institution had a monopoly on religious truth. The philosopher John Locke argued that compelling one's conscience violated one's natural rights, rights that every person, regardless of background or nationality, possessed. These natural rights were the rights to life, liberty, and property. Locke argued for the separation of church and state. In Locke's view, the state should exist only to defend the liberty of its citizens. What people believed was no business but their own. In a famous example, Locke argued that if your religion required you to sacrifice a goat, you should be perfectly free to do so, so long as you sacrificed your goat and didn't steal anyone else's. As we can see by this example, religious freedom and political liberty were seen as virtually identical. It was no surprise that states that insisted on uniformity, like Catholic France, were also states that expected subjects to obey every whim of their monarchs. France in the 18th century possessed an absolute monarchy, one in which there were no significant restrictions on the king's power. King Louis XIV put it best when he uttered the immortal phrase, l'état c'est moi, I am the state. There was no Magna Carta guaranteeing trial by jury, and certainly no freedom of speech or the press. Those were liberties that existed mainly in England, where they were upheld by Parliament, a legislative body with elected representatives. This was not democracy. Only men who owned property worth more than 40 pounds could vote, a qualification that encompassed only about 20% of adult men. Still, only Parliament possessed the right to levy taxes, so if the king needed money to go to war or pursue an expensive project, he had no choice but to summon Parliament. It was this power of the purse that seemed to guarantee liberty, ensuring that there would always be a forum to air grievances and pass laws. Monarchs chafed at these restrictions to their power, but English liberties grew so entrenched that they could not easily be swept away. When the 17th century King Charles I sought to govern without Parliament, the end result would be a decade of civil war and the King's eventual overthrow and execution. In a foretaste of what would happen during the French Revolution, though, Parliament had trouble governing without a King to establish legitimacy. Oliver Cromwell, the brilliant general who commanded Parliament's forces, 
installed himself as England's Lord Protector, a kind of dictator. After Cromwell's death, Charles' exiled son, also named Charles, was restored to the throne, but Charles II understood that he would either rule with Parliament or not at all. When his Catholic brother James appeared to threaten Parliament's privileges upon coming to the throne in 1685, the kingdom's notables engineered his overthrow and invited James's son-in-law and daughter, William and Mary, to take the throne. This became known as the Glorious Revolution, called glorious because it involved relatively little bloodshed, at least in England. In its aftermath, Parliament approved a Bill of Rights guaranteeing liberties like speech in the press. These freedoms, which existed in England's colonies as well as the mother country, were thought to be the foundations of the country's greatness. And central to those liberties was the ability of property owners to elect representatives that would vote the kingdom's taxes. This was the glue that held the constitutional system together, along with the separation of powers between Parliament, the monarch, and the courts. Britain's mixed constitution would be held up during the 18th century as a model to follow. Its defenders included the French Baron de Montesquieu, who in his spirit of laws contended that each part of Britain's government balanced the other. A strong parliament checked the monarchy, which might otherwise devolve into tyranny, but a strong monarch prevented representative government from devolving into anarchy. Courts, meanwhile, assured the supremacy of the law. These and other ideas were hotly debated during what became known as the Enlightenment, an era of intellectual ferment and discovery. Enlightenment philosophers, known in French as philosophes, sought to use reason to discover the proper means of governing society. Many scorned tradition, believing that fealty to tradition often meant allowing both superstition and inefficiency to flourish. They directed their ire toward the Catholic Church and the untrammeled power of kings, which they believed held society back from its true greatness. Denis Diderot, the author of the very first encyclopedia, itself subversive because an encyclopedia begins with the letter A rather than with God, insisted that man will not be free until the last king is strangled with the entrails of the last priest. The French philosophe Voltaire signed his letters with the phrase, erase the infamy, that infamy being the Catholic Church. As we'll see in class, such ideas would later inspire the French revolutionaries to attempt to abolish the Catholic Church and replace it with a temple of reason a sort of deist religion with a clockmaker god who created the world and did nothing else. As Voltaire was fond of saying, if a merchant sends a cargo of goods to Egypt, does he care about the welfare of the mice on board? Enlightenment philosophers disagreed with one another about the proper mode of government. Some advocated a philosopher king, others a rudimentary form of socialism. Most agreed that religious fanaticism and titles of nobility were bad, hoping to remove entrenched privileges anywhere they found them. The Age of Revolutions emerged out of the Enlightenment, an intoxicating period where people of all backgrounds struggled, as they saw it, to begin the world anew. Events, of course, would put ideas of liberty and equality to the test. In colonial America, opposition to taxes imposed by Parliament would provoke revolution in the name of all men being created equal. Decrying the principle of taxation without representation, as colonists elected their own assemblies but had no vote in Parliament, American patriots asserted Locke's belief that control over taxation was the only sure defense of liberty. Severely indebted after war with France, the British Parliament imposed a series of direct taxes on British colonies. These included the Stamp Act, which imposed duties on a range of products, as well as the Townsend Acts and the Tea Act. Previously, taxes had been voted upon in colonial assemblies alone, but the British government hoped to exert tighter control over its empire by directly taxing its colonies. This provoked widespread colonial opposition, with men like Boston's Sam Adams and Virginia's Patrick Henry insisting that their rights as Englishmen were being violated. Protests followed, culminating in the Boston Tea Party of 1773, when a group of patriots dressed as Mohawks raided British ships and dumped tea into the harbor. They objected in this case to the monopoly of the British East India Company on the sale of tea in the colonies, 
which they saw as part of a British plot to control American commerce. The British government responded with what became known as the Intolerable Acts, a series of laws that closed the Boston Harbor and dismissed the Massachusetts Assembly. Here was the Enlightenment's worst nightmare, the first overthrow of an elected assembly. Twelve of the thirteen colonies sent representatives to a Continental Congress to respond to the crisis, which eventually exploded into war when the British attempted to seize gunpowder being collected by the Massachusetts militia. At first, the colonists sought to protect their rights as Englishmen, but as the war continued, many began advocating total independence from the mother country. Congress commissioned Thomas Jefferson, a man who conceived of himself as an Enlightenment philosopher, to pen a Declaration of Independence. Jefferson drew heavily on Locke, but his stirring assertion that all men are created equal would serve as an inspiration for centuries to come. America would, of course, win its independence, which the British formally recognized the Treaty of Paris in 1783. As we'll see in class, the Americans were backed by the French, who were determined to deal a blow to their British rivals, but accumulated massive debts in the process. Nevertheless, the new nation was not exactly a place where all men were created equal, a point that Jefferson, a slave owner, acknowledged. American slavery would persist for nearly 90 years after the Declaration was adopted by Congress. These same contradictions would be present in the French Revolution as well, where the assertion that men are born free clashed with the reality of slavery in France's Caribbean colonies. And in both countries, assertion of the equality of men said nothing about the status of women, a point condemned by critics like Abigail Adams and Mary Wollstonecraft. But once assertions of liberty and equality were made, they could not easily be unmade. The promise and the contradictions of the Enlightenment are still very much with us.